Hey folks, welcome back to another Data Science 1 lecture. Uh, today in our quest for more and more complex models, uh, we're going to talk about uh, neural networks. This will be the, the first part in a two-part series on neural networks, uh, since these uh, are uh, machine learning approaches to many different types of data and, and applied fields. So today we're going to give a, a broad overview about uh, kind of what neural networks are and, and why we think they might be important. And then next time we'll turn to a slightly more practical uh, approach of, of how you might use uh, this general idea with a few uh, extra tricks for specific data types or, or uh, subfields. So uh, to, to orient us, uh, neural networks uh, have, have gotten a lot of hype recently. Um, and are, are uh, you know claimed to be the the next great thing in, in AI um, and are uh, mimicking the way the brain works um, and will will unlock all of the secrets and and I'm certainly uh, to, to some degree on, on the bandwagon being a, a neural network researcher myself um, but what I what I want really want to get across today is not how fancy and complicated these models are, but, but how they're just simple uh, abstractions and generalizations of the things we've already learned in class um, and, and are really just doing classification uh, the, the way that, that we're already familiar with it, but uh, throw in some extra tricks that, uh, that let us uh, approach uh, maybe more difficult or complex problems than some of the approaches we've talked about so far. So uh, rather than, than take the, the biologically inspired approach, let's, let's start with the, the, the math and what uh, classification actually looks like inside a neural network. So uh, like we've done uh, with a lot of approaches before, let's start at the, the basic starting point for classification or, or modeling in general, which is regression. Um, so we, we've talked about uh, linear regression of you know, fitting uh, outputs to, to inputs with uh, some slope and some bias intercept. Um, we've talked about, uh, about uh, formulating this as a, a parameter vector, that this could happen in, in one dimensional space or in, across multiple dimensions. Um, and, uh, and we've talked about how uh, we can take this, this approach and turn it into a classification problem. So this is, uh, is of course, uh, our, our transition early in the semester from linear regression to logistic regression, looking at, uh, at specifying real valued outputs versus, uh, versus output classes, and, and specifically kind of zero to one probabilities of, of that class being present. Um, and we were able to do this by some nonlinear function, uh, in this case a, a sigmoid that mapped our, all of our outputs into a, a zero to one probability of, of, of that feature uh, being present or not. So we're, we're going to uh, expand upon uh, these, these two ideas of logistic regression and linear regression and show how neural networks are, uh, are one further level of abstraction outside of this. Um, so, so we're, we're familiar with the idea of taking in features, weighting them, looking at some weighted sum, um, and, and with logistic regression, some nonlinear weighted sum, because uh, you've, you've squashed them too, um, and, and using that to specify whether or not our output variables are, are present or not given some input with some, uh, some, uh, some value that we can maybe represent as a probability. So to, to uh, match that with the, the basic unit of a neural network, uh, which is a, a single neuron or uh, what we, we often call a, a perceptron, um, the, the ideas here are, are very similar uh, in that uh, what we're looking at is, is some, uh, some mechanism, this is going to be the, the big node in the middle, um, that processes data. And that's going to take in some inputs uh, from the, the circle on the left and pass it through uh, to, to some outputs, which is the, the circle on the right. Um, and you can think of, uh, think of this as, as being one basic unit, or you can think of it as, as kind of being you know, a, a connection between uh, you know, two or three different, uh, different steps um, in, uh, in a neural network to, to start to build out a, a network. And, and that'll be a little bit more obvious in, in just a second. But to, to relate this to the, the simple approaches that we've seen so far, uh, if we think of the input as being some value of our input variable, um, some you know, real valued x, 
uh, and we multiply that by uh, some parameter theta, which in, in a neural network we're going to call the weight. Um, so this is the the slope of um, uh, of our regression line. This is 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 equivalent to the weight in our neural network. Um, and then again, pass it through some squashing function, uh, for example, a sigmoid uh, that, that turns it into a zero to one probability. Um, this, this doesn't necessarily have to be a zero to one probability, um, but, uh, but for, for the sake of, uh, of explanation, let's, let's say that that's the case. And what we spit out is our probability of y being, uh, being present given x. So just like uh, linear regression, uh, we we're also going to think about uh, a bias uh, with, uh, within this equation. And we can represent that uh, the same way we would represent uh, an input from a scalar value. We're just going to say that the, the variable that this uh, weight, this theta, is taking in is just a, a column of, of all ones. It's just always going to be a, a constant. Um, this uh, isn't uh, super uh, super necessary for, for your intuition if, if this is a little bit fuzzy to you, uh, but uh, it just helps you to, to better be able um, to, to take in the, the input variables that you have. Um, and, and, that, and that's uh, to say that uh, maybe there is, is some offset or, or, or some, uh, some constant relationship between uh, the the input variables and the output. So uh, the, the most literal one would be that if theta one was zero and you were just looking at the input, then y would be a constant value of one or, or whatever theta zero is. Um, and, and we can uh, apply this approach uh, with as many inputs as we want, just like we could look at multiple linear regression or logistic regression with lots and lots of inputs. Um, and uh, just like we did there, we're going to take the the weighted sum of those inputs. So we're going to multiply the input by its its weight, um, and we're going to add them together and squash them through some uh, some nonlinear function like a sigmoid. So what uh, what you have written here is the the function of your perceptron uh, is uh, is in this case exactly equivalent to what logistic regression did. Um, and that's to say we're looking at the likelihood of an output given some set of inputs and our, our model, which is our thetas. Um, so the, the first place where uh, neural networks can differ from, uh, lo from logistic regression is that we don't necessarily now have to just use the logistic sign. Um, or we, we often will use a sigmoid type uh, or sigmoid shaped, uh, say S shaped functions, uh, or we're taking a, a large range of, of inputs and squashing them down into a smaller range of outputs that look like probabilities. Um, but they don't necessarily have to be the, the sigmoid that maps it from zero to one. Uh, you can imagine like a hyperbolic tangent that uh, is a function that maps uh, a, a, an infinite input space into negative one and one. Uh, another really common one for reasons we, we won't get into uh, right now is uh, a, a ReLU function, um, which is a, a regularized linear unit. Um, and, and that uh, takes the inputs um, and, and just uh, removes anything below zero. So it says only look at the, the positive values um, uh, from, your, uh, from your, your weighted sum of inputs. Um, and and this is uh, is is nice for bigger neural networks. Uh, makes a little bit less sense for for smaller neural networks. But uh, again, the the implementation details are are beyond what I want to get across right now. The uh, analogy um, to to the brain uh, maybe is is slightly more clear as we um, as we kind of think about what these neurons are computationally. In that, uh, just like we take a lot of inputs. Uh, sum them together and uh, and pass them through some nonlinear function um, that turns out to be a, a roughly equivalent function to uh, to grabbing electric le grabbing electric signals from a bunch of dendrites uh, that uh, that feed into the the cell body of a cell and then if there's enough value um, you'll get some nonlinear spike where your your axon will uh, shoot out an electric pulse to to the the downstream uh, nodes.
uh, this is is nice uh, for all the reasons that logistic regression was nice, and that it you know draws lines through feature space that uh, that allow you to um, to classify the presence of some y outputs. Um, and uh, we we didn't go into to detail of just how expressive this is for logistic regression, but uh, but you can note here. Uh, even though I'm I'm covering up one of the the dots on the the top right plot, um, that uh, that we're uh, looking at um, at uh, specifying uh, a a logical function. So the the weights on the the left network just happen to represent a, a, an AND function, which will you know spike if uh, both the the uh, both of the the inputs are turned on. Um, on the, the right is an OR where the, the output will spike if either of the inputs is turned on. Um, and, and here I mean I mean spike as in have an output that's positive versus, uh, versus zero or, or negative output depending on what what, sig or what uh, activation function you choose. Um, and uh, and this, uh, this is, is nice in that uh, it, it gives us some confidence that we can, uh, go about uh, taking a bunch of inputs and, and making uh, making decisions about them. Um, obviously, this is something we could do with logistic regression, and, and similarly, we we can do it here too. Um, but the the idea of uh, of combining uh, inputs and, and asking when uh, some or all of them are present will will be uh, a little bit more important for for neural networks. We'll see that in, in just a second here, um, and the. The, the background to that is that uh, when we thought about logistic regression, uh, we were looking at combining uh, a bunch of variables, a bunch of features that we had in our data. Um, and the, the question uh, that, that comes out of this uh, for, for any sort of practical modeling is, uh, is uh, what features do you, do you even begin with that, that you want to be putting together? Um, so sometimes this is, is pre-specified by the type of data that you have. Um, and, and so if, if you have a, you know, a bunch of uh, clear features that, that you know are important to your data set, um, then something like logistic regression, which will take all of those features and, and put them together, uh, makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, but, but many times it's not totally clear what the, the ideal features are to be combining. Um, and and we you know just go from from what we have in our data, which uh, sometimes makes sense as as knowing that those are important axes along which our model has variation. Um, but depending on what type of data you're feeding in, maybe that's that's not the case. Um, so we we looked at the uh, example uh, in, in class before of uh, of uh, pixel images. Um, and with logistic regression, it uh, it absolutely did not make sense to think about those features um, as as being uh, being important and independent features uh, within within your model. Um, and so so the the broader question here is how do you figure out what features are important? The what we've talked about uh, throughout the class so far uh, has has assumed that you have important features that you're trying to look at, at combinations of, and so we've said you know go talk to domain experts, go do a bunch of feature engineering to try and generate a uh, a diverse and an important set of features and feed those into your models. Uh, you can think of that you know in, in the domestication of, of cats and dogs. Uh, for for some of the examples today, we're going to use uh, the the classification of uh, of flowers, um, looking at uh, at distinguishing the the um, varieties based off of a, a bunch of, of features and, and measurements um, in uh, in irises. Uh, this is uh, the the iris data set and includes things like the the size and uh, the the length and width of the petals and the sepals, um, different parts of of the flower. Uh, this is a, a classic. Uh, classic uh, machine learning data set. So we, uh, to, to use that data set, had to specify that those things, the sepals and the, the petal sizes, were important for distinguishing between the type of viruses, which uh, I, I'm not a, a botanist, um, but, uh, but I would have no idea that those are important just looking at the data um, from, uh, from, from this problem. 
Um, and so uh, the the approach that neural networks takes uh, is is a, I think a really elegant one, um, and and it tries to uh, to to not specify uh, or place so much uh, emphasis on domain knowledge and feature engineering, but tries to to learn the features themselves. So the way that we'll do this is a, a multi layer perceptron. So we, we just talked about uh, single perceptrons, uh, and the, the idea here is that we can automatically find out what features are important for our problem just by stacking together perceptrons or, or neurons into big networks. And uh, the one of the crucial aspects here is, is Big. So the, the more neurons that you stack together, the more intermediate features and, and kind of automatic feature engineering or the complexity of features that you can, you can automatically find in, in your models. And so that's why uh, when we think about uh, deep learning as, as being this you know, new and magical thing, it's because there's lots of features, lots of uh, perceptron stacking and lots of features that are being uh, automatically found. Um, by by our models, so to to spend uh, just a few minutes uh, talking about what what this actually means, um, but before we get into to the more uh, applied sections uh, next class, uh, the the idea is is literally as as simple as uh, as as I laid out where we're just stacking these neural networks together, and and specifically that means that uh, that when we were taking inputs in from what we presumed was some, you know, data that we'd collected, and looking at outputs, which we uh, have before presumed are uh, our dependent variables in our data set. Um, instead, we're going to, uh, to to think about intermediate values. So, if you were to to take in um, some uh, some some input and pass it through a perceptron, you would get some, some output variable y, but then that y you would turn around and use as the, the input, the x, into another model. Um, and so we're, we're training models to take uh, what are found in prior models and combine that information together. And, and you can maybe already imagine how powerful of an idea this is. Um, in the example of, uh, of looking at the, the pictures of the irises, um, what, what we did um, was to, to take that snapshot of, of the iris and then uh, look at, uh, at where you know, the, the purple leaf for the, the petal was and then maybe take a little, little ruler and, uh, and measure what the size was. And we treated that as our, as our feature that, that was important for the, the problem. And then said, okay, if we have a bunch of features like sepal width and, and length and the petal width and length and, and potentially many others, uh, we can uh, build a model that, that classifies uh, the, the type of iris that we're looking at. With this idea of, of stacked models, um, since the, the input isn't a, a feature that you explicitly state uh, in your data column, so you don't have to, to say that this is the feature of sepal width. Um, instead, you just say that the feature that we're going to pass into our, our iris model on the right is just something, and that something is whatever was output by the model on the left that, that was feeding into it. Um, and so what, uh, what, what we've done here is we, we've taken away uh, the need to specify features or, or more explicitly to do good feature engineering. And, and, and that is the, the you know, big uh, knockout punch of, of neural networks and what I, I think makes them really powerful tools for, for really complex problems. Um, in that we've totally sidestepped this, this idea of asking what features are important for, uh, for a problem. Um, and we could take in, you know, really naive raw data like what color is the pixels in this image, um, and and it can spit out uh, something like what type of flower it is without having to know all of the intermediate steps of of what what features or what attributes of flowers we should be looking for. Um, and and you can uh, think of of many pros and cons of that, which we'll we'll touch on uh, in, in a moment here. Um, but uh, the, the, the idea of, of stacking uh, these, these uh, perceptrons together is a, a really powerful one. Um, and, and it's something that, that we'll do you know, throughout uh, the, the network, that, that every input um, to, 
uh, to a subsequent layer will be the uh, the outputs of of some perceptron from the layer before that that may or may not be uh, the the same function um, feeding into the 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 uh, the the next layer. So you can imagine that you know maybe the model that is pulling out what was the equivalent of petal width is very similar to what the model was that was looking at the equivalent of, of sepal width. Um, they're just passing in slightly different input data or looking for slightly different patterns. Um, and, and so there, there could be some relationships between the types of models that we glue together here. And we'll talk about that a little bit more next time too. Um, but uh, but, but the, the idea of, of stacking these up is something that, that is important and that, that will apply more and more broadly, um, again, getting into deeper and deeper networks. And, and you can imagine if each of these you know, little, uh, little bubbles here uh, little perceptrons are logistic regression models that where we're now looking at you know a model of a model of a model of a model um, and so the the level of complexity that we can imagine from the outputs of this uh, may be very interesting nonlinear highly nonlinear combinations of, of our inputs and that's to say that we can uh, we can represent really complex patterns and trends in our data that uh, with, with enough neurons, with a, a deep enough network and, and a wide enough network, um, you can, uh, in theory, represent any, any possible function with, with a neural network. This, uh, in practice, um, it may, not, uh, may not be the case um, that, uh, that you want to build a network big enough to, to be a universal function approximator. Um, but it's, it's nice to know that, uh, that there really is no ceiling on the complexity of, of these models. Um, Building more and more complex models and, and training them well is is an issue, um, but that's a, again something we'll we'll touch on a little bit more next time. So, uh, like uh, like, like I, I mentioned before, the, the the magic of these is that we we aren't specifying anything about this this center part of the model, what we call the the hidden nodes, um, and uh, and. Uh, and the proportion of nodes that uh, are automatically found, uh, as, as you can imagine, get more and more as these networks get bigger and bigger. Um, and so uh, again, the deep neural networks are doing lots and lots of, of processing within themselves, um, where we just have to, again, specify what our inputs X and what our outputs Y. Um, and, and these inputs X, uh, can be and, and often tend to be really high dimensional data. Um, and, and so for that reason, uh, these neural networks uh, with a, a few added tricks are really good for high dimensional inputs, especially uh, structured inputs. So, so one of the, the tricks we'll talk about next time is, is uh, the idea of, of convolutions, uh, which, uh, which uh, specify similar models um, for, for each of the, the inputs. Um, like we talked about, uh, you know, pedal width and sepal width being similar, uh, it makes the assumption that the type of things you're looking for are similar across different inputs in some really high dimensional input space like an image. Um, and, and so that, that's a, a little trick that makes these easier to train. Um, but uh, but the, the, the takeaway from today is just that you can pass in really high dimensional inputs um, and, and build some really complex function that tells you what the output Y is without having to specify anything about the model complexity um, and, and the features that it's representing within that. Um, as long as you, you have enough capacity, enough uh, size in your network to be able to represent that function, uh, ideally the, the training process um, of, of gradient descent, uh, which is a, again an iterative optimization process, um, will uh, will hopefully find that function for you. So so that's that's nice in that these are really you know black box hands off approaches. Um, obviously black boxes come with with trade offs in that when we when we uh, are letting machine learning find out what all of the intermediate features are, it can be really hard to. Uh, to then understand relationships within our problem, and and so you know uh, these neural networks are often much better for times when we're doing inference and we care about just giving the outputs of, of a new sample uh, uh, when we're doing prediction uh, and, and looking at giving the outputs of a new sample, and, and much less so when we're when we're looking at inference or we're trying to you know understand something uh, fundamental about the the population or, or, or data set that we're working with to begin with. Um, 
And so, so uh, there, there are uh, approaches that we can go about to think about looking at, at what the features uh, in the middle are or could be. Uh, we we uh, went through this a little bit with the PCA example um, last time, um, where we saw that, uh, that we can find out what features are being fed into whatever model uh, before it was, was a, a logistic regression model or, or a, a clustering model. Um, and uh, and and try and and guess what uh, what what it is that they're actually representing, but it's it's a really uh, really not straightforward process. Um, but the the nice thing about them is uh, we if if all we care about is prediction, we don't have to understand anything about these these intermediate uh, features, and and practically we don't need to spend the, the time and effort to manually engineer them. Or, or think about uh, think about what uh, what dimensions uh, variation exists in our problem that, that we let uh, gradient descent and machine learning do all of the heavy lifting there. Um, so, uh, like I said, we we have some approaches maybe to try and, and see what uh, what these features are if we are trying to to get some understanding, um, and uh, and and they. Uh, are are not uh, all that straightforward. Um, we'll we'll talk uh, about this uh, again a little bit more next class. Uh, but I'll, I'll just uh, tease an example from structured image data, um, which is one of the use cases we'll we'll talk about next time. Um, that that's saying that uh, you know these subsequent features that we end up finding through through gradient descent through our iterative optimization, uh, actually do look like they're uh, combining uh, from simple to complex features as we as we combine more and more simple models together. That uh, if, if we're feeding in an image and looking at uh, the, the pixels as being, uh, you know, uh, different uh, input variables, um, and then maybe the, the simplest combination of, of those together are things like lines and edges and blobs. And uh, with, with some of these tricks, that's actually what you find uh, at the, the first level of a, a neural network. As you get higher up, you can imagine kind of prototype objects um, that, that are looking at, at things that uh, are important for, for building the thing you're trying to classify. So this is, if this is a face detector, maybe some of those important things are, are uh, eyes or, or a mouth or a nose. Um, that, uh, that, that are features that you would want to have if you were classifying faces. Um, and and uh, it may, makes sense uh, from a feature engineering perspective to assume that those are the important features for figuring out when, where or when there's a face. Um, but for, for other, uh, other um, classification problems where it's not quite so straightforward what the, the fundamental pieces of a uh, a, a, a object or outcome are um, the the fact that uh, that we can find ones that make sense give us uh, a lot of hope that uh, that for generalizing those other problems we'll end up uh, end up performing well uh, and then uh, at the the output layer here we'll we'll have some uh, some output that tells us uh, you know whether or not we did specify or whether or not we we found the thing that, that we were looking for with our, our output variable in this case, you know, detecting whether a face or not was present in, in this image. And so um, yeah, just passing in the, the inputs, the pixels, and knowing what output you want to face, uh, finding the, the prototypical features, or uh, if 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 you believe that uh, that machine learning is doing its job well, which is usually true, then then this would be like the optimal, the ideal features uh, to find. Uh, within a model um, that uh, that that uh, uh, gradient descent is doing that. So so that's that's really fantastic to to hear that um, we not only ha have a, a method that uh, is able to stop us from doing feature engineering on these really complex high dimensional data sets, um, but it's finding really good and, and intuitive features. Um, at least to to the degree that we can inspect them, which is is not so much as as hand design features where we know exactly what we're specifying and and inputting into the problem. Uh, so so just to to wrap up this this broad overview, um, the the idea of neural networks or uh, multi-layer perceptrons is is a really appealing one. Um, 
because it, it can learn uh, potentially very complex models straight from raw input data. Um, and it doesn't need uh, really cleverly or effectively hand designed features to be able to do that. Um, the, the structure of, of this uh, approach is very general and you can think about um, approaches where we're, we're taking many different models and, and combining them um, into uh, a, a fairly shallow network that, that looks at, at, uh, at taking uh, a wide variety of attributes and combining them. Or we could think of, of really deep models that, that say, um, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, features that are really complex and, and hierarchically dependent. Um, and so what we need is, is more and more of this feature engineering to build up more and more complexity. And so based off of the, the, the structure of your, your network, um, you can represent uh, different types and, and very complex features. Um, how it is that we choose the, the right structure is a, a very hard problem in practice and one that we're, we're not going to talk about at all in this class. Um, but uh, but for, for starters, um, there are, are lots of examples of existing architectures that, that work well for a variety of problems. And, and for your projects, that's probably a, a good starting point is, is uh, uh, looking at someone who's already done something similar to what you are in, in using their architecture. Um, but uh, but that's a, a not a very satisfying answer um, for, for a whole bunch of reasons that, that we don't have time to, to go into depth on. Um, and then and speaking of the, the structure, um, well, we'll talk more about uh, details next class, but um, the, the idea of uh, having repeated structure within uh, data that has some sort of regularity or inherent structure, like pixels within an image or like uh, a time series unfolding over time, um, or, or like language data um, that's that's unfolding sequentially as well. Um, th this approach can be really good for for modeling those, um, and and we'll talk about some of those specific use cases uh, in in just a bit. Uh, cons uh, besides the, uh, the the setting of of hyperparameters like the neural architecture um, are that uh, oftentimes the features are are pretty difficult to interpret. Uh, it just so happened that uh, the example I showed you was one where we had a pretty good idea of what features would look like, and it was a spatial problem, so we were able to see those features spatially. Um, what what we get for for problems that that aren't spatially oriented or, or simple like this is uh, you know our intermediate feature vectors just being a big list of numbers and figuring out what strategy the network is taking from seeing. Uh, what intermediate transformations of a big uh, hunk of a vector um, uh, that, uh, that 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 the model uses as its as its engineered features um, can be a really hard thing to do. That uh, that that generally we should think of these models as black boxes where we don't know what's happening in in between them. Uh, we we just know uh, the inputs and the outputs. Um, and, and relying on the fact that if the outputs are coming out the way that we want, hopefully what's happening in the middle makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and another con of, of these types of models is because we're learning potentially very complex uh, um, uh, structures and, and dependencies, uh, because those can be very general, uh, that the amount of data that you'll need to not only learn the model output, but also learn all of the intermediate features is, as you can imagine, typically much more data than you would need if you were to hand the, uh, a model some features already and just ask it to combine those into, into outputs. Um, and uh, again, there are tricks uh, that, that you can use uh, along this domain. Uh, for example, uh, looking at features that have been successful for prior problems and trying to, to use those as the features that you hand to your, your model. Uh, this idea is called transfer learning and that we, we transfer features in from, uh, from uh, prior, uh, prior problems or prior models. Um, that, that can maybe sidestep some of the issues here, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's still practically um, often a constraint looking at neural networks and deep learning that, uh, that these are best suited towards big data sets, uh, which uh, I, I know for, for some of you in your projects is okay, and for others uh, means that this is, is probably not a good tool um, for, for you to be using for that reason. Um, so uh, that's 
uh, that that's all I, I want to say about the the broad overview of what what neural networks are and what make them special in general. Um, I'll say that, that for those of you who want to apply these, like uh, most of the things we've talked about so far, uh, these multi-layer perceptron classifiers are available within Scikit-Learn, um, and and are, are really nice ways to get up and running with with your existing pipelines. Um, some of you have, have already figured out that uh, some of the, the tricks we'll talk about next time uh, are beyond what Scikit-Learn has for complexity of models. But in terms of, of the, the multi-layer perceptrons we've talked about in today's lecture, all of that uh, can, can be found uh, through, through this MLP classifier function. Uh, so for the sake of time, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up here um, and, and save some of the special uh, use cases and, and applications and, and some of the, the details uh, and, and a, a lot of tips and tricks around that for next lecture um, for, uh, for part two of, of neural networks. Um, in the meantime, uh, um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see you for class. Um, and, and feel free to uh, you know ask questions uh, about what we've learned here, but also uh, about uh, uh, some of the the use cases and, uh, and and open questions that you'd like to hear about more in the in the next lecture too. Uh, until then, uh, have a good one, and uh, we'll we'll see you online.